we welcome you all and hope that you will join us often for an exciting array of programs throughout this year. And do please see our Brandeis Schusterman Center webpage for further details. This evening's program entitled Herzlemania had its genesis some years ago when I met David Matlow, a Brandeis parent, and he invited me to his home in Toronto to see his unique collection of Theodore Herzl ephemera, the largest such collection anywhere in the world. Knowing that this year marks the 125th anniversary of Herzl's The Jewish State, a book that electrified the Jewish world, we decided to commission a film that briefly recounts the story of Theodore Herzl and displays items from the Maplow collection. That film premieres tonight. Central to that film, as you will see, is Herzl's most recent biographer, Professor Derek Penzlar of Harvard University, who he graciously agreed to speak to us uh, about Theodore Herzl. And uh, I want to recommend that everybody listening purchase and read his brilliant brief biography of Herzl entitled Theodore Herzl, the Charismatic Leader, published by Yale University Press. It is the best brief biography of Theodore Herzl uh, ever written. Before turning to the main part of the program, I want to introduce uh, some new members of our Schusterman uh, community. Uh, Professor Yuval Every, who is on my left, has joined us as assistant professor of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies on the Marash and Akuin Chair in Ottoman Mizrahi and Sephardic Jewish Studies. Uh, Professor Every's research focuses on the cultural political history of the land of Israel, uh, focusing on Sephardic and Arab Jewish thought. Uh, Professor Every has just published a book in Hebrew on disputes over Sephardic culture and identity between Arabic and Hebrew. We hope the book will appear in English before too long. Uh, and Professor Every is going to be deeply engaged in introducing our Brandeis community to this crucially important an all too little understood world of Ottoman, Mizrahi, and Sephardic Jews. So stay tuned for many programs. Uh, we're also excited uh, to introduce, she's um, uh, on our Zoom audience, our postdoctoral fellow uh, for the next two years, Dr. Shula Mola. Dr. Mola is one of the leaders of the Ethiopian Jewish community in Israel. She served as chair of the Association for Ethiopian Jews for 10 years, uh, prior to which she worked at that organization and various other positions, including executive director. Shula Mola is well known in Israel as a civil and human rights activist, she has a recent PhD from Ben Gurion University, and she has very big plans while at Brandeis to work on ways to utilize new media to advance the preservation of the Ethiopian Jewish heritage and culture in Israel, and to help construct a strong community identity to confront the alienation and crises faced by Ethiopian Israeli community members. Some of you will remember Shula Moller from our program on Blackness in Israel, which you can find on our YouTube channel. And we expect her to play a significant role, not only here at Brandeis uh, and at Schusterman, 
but um, but really uh, uh, throughout the larger community uh, as well. Finally, I want to thank our hardworking and deeply dedicated system and center staff who worked tirelessly uh, through the pandemic to bring quality programming uh, 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 to you. Um, uh, some of them are on Zoom working even now. Dr. Shana Weiss, uh, uh, who um, really worked tirelessly through the pandemic, and who, by the way, Dr. Weiss is teaching an oversubscribed brand new course here on Israeli popular culture. Uh, our associate director for administration, Risa Singer, who keeps us solvent and efficient. Our senior program coordinator, Anna Simpson, who makes this and all of our programs possible. Our communication specialist, Karen Goodblatt, who makes sure that you know about our programs. And our senior department coordinator, Wendy Schwartz, who, among many other things, keeps the director of system in, in order. So we have a wonderful staff, and I want to thank you. I thank them all. And now, without further ado, we have also a magnificent program for you. We start with the premiere of Herzlmania, directed by Daniel Mooney. If you have questions or comments, please write them in the chat at the very bottom uh, of your screen. You'll find a chat function. All questions and comments can be sent there. And uh, Dr. Weiss is, is, is carefully moder moder uh, monitoring uh, the chat on our uh, behalf. Um, that's all from me. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Herzl Mania. Charisma does not exist in a vacuum. Charisma is situational. Charisma is something that is constructed by an audience. It was a moment in late 19th century Jewish history. Anti-Semitism, poverty, persecution, assimilation, everything was up in the air. Many Jews were looking for a charismatic leader. And along came Herzl. I've had a fascination with Herzl since I was a child, which is obviously very unusual. My fascination is really about where the state of Israel came from. My grandparents moved from Toronto to Israel in 1955. We used to go there as kids in the 60s to spend the summer with our grandparents. At the same time, I've always collected things. I have a collection of collections. In 1991, my grandmother passed away. And in her home in Ramat Gan, there was a portrait of Herzl. That was the first item in my collection. I came to realize there was such a thing as Herzl memorabilia. And started to collect it, which resulted in ultimately having this collection, which is the world's largest collection of Herzl memorabilia. Born in Budapest in 1860, Herzl was the quintessential European. He was raised in a bilingual home. He spoke Hungarian and German with equal fluency. His first letters to his parents were written at the age of six. Dear father, dear mother, how are you? I am well. Love, your son, Tibadar. Herzl is often described as being from an assimilated home. The word assimilation has connotations of escape from Jewishness, of living without knowledge or in ignorance of one's Jewishness. One thing we can be sure of 
If a Jew is growing up in Budapest in the 1860s, 1870s and beyond, the one thing they are never not aware of is their Jewishness. His father himself had been raised in an Orthodox home. Herzl attended what we would call today a Jewish day school. He loved very few people. He loved his sister, his older sister, Pauline, who died tragically. He never got over her death. So Herzl was a lonely man. When he was a teenager, he began writing for newspapers. He would go on to become the Paris correspondent of the Neue Freie Presse, the most prestigious newspaper in Central Europe. Paris, as Walter Benjamin said, was the capital of the 19th century. And Herzl was in his element. He knew everybody. He knew Clemenceau, he knew Proust. He had a gift for journalism. But Herzl never respected journalism. What he wanted was to be a great playwright, and Herzl wrote many plays. His plays were performed in Prague, New York, and Berlin, and even in Vienna, at the most prestigious theater in Vienna, the Burgtheater. But the plays were wooden, light, drawing room comedies. He didn't burn with the desire to express himself the way that great artists can. He simply wanted to be successful. It's funny because I can't remember the first time I heard about Herzl. Growing up in a Jewish American household, a Zionist household, it was a name and a figure that was always there. I think he really has this interesting duality. And like any symbol, you can sort of project whatever you want on him. The hipster Herzl, Herzl on t-shirts, Herzl bobbleheads, etc. People have been collecting Herzl memorabilia since the time of Herzl's life. And part of the reason for that is that the idea that Herzl had, which was expressed in the Judenstadt, Jewish state, was such a new idea. The thought that the Jewish people could have their own homeland, which was a real paradigm shift in the minds of Jewish people. Anti-Semitism is the dark underside of European civilization. He had been exposed to it in Paris at the time of the scandal over corruption in the company that was building the Panama Canal, all the way through that first trial known as the Dreyfus Affair. Herzl was a man by 1895, in his mid-30s, in a state of crisis. And then he entered into a period of frenzy in which he began to write furiously about dreams for how to solve the problem of the Jews. And some of that material became his pamphlet, The Jewish State, in 1896. And the answer for him is to create a Jewish homeland in which Jews will be safe, in which they'll be able to live as Jews as they wish, religious or secular, or wherever they define it, but there won't be anti-Semitism. And, as he depicts in his novel, The New Lamb, it will be an intensely and thoroughly European uh, society. You have to remember, you can't read history backwards. We know when we're reading Herzl that the Ottoman Empire is going to be over in 15, 20 years. He doesn't know that. The Ottoman Empire has been around for 400 years. So this idea that you could have a new configuration in the Middle East, and especially this push towards a state, is really radical. He understood the ability to communicate ideas through theater, and the Zionist Congresses were, in a sense, a kind of theater. What needs to happen for a movement to be created, the role of mass culture, mass media, in creating a nationalist identity. And he wants to be famous. He wants to be known. So all of that has given rise to so many things to collect. Herzl did not invent the Zionist movement. It existed before him, but it was very small and weak. And he created an institutional structure. He created a way of talking about Zionism. After all, the word Zionism didn't even exist until the early 1890s. And Herzl's the one who actually picked up the word and began to use it systematically. On the other hand, he never really deals with Palestinian Arab feelings or opposition to Zionism. Remember that Herzl went to Palestine only once in his life, 
And when he was there, he wrote about Arabs in a highly cursory way. He wrote about villages neglected, quote, in Arab fashion, end quote. There's very little engagement. There's certainly no engagement with Arabs in Palestine as a collective, as a group, with a will and desire of their own. A truly great charismatic leader, if we're gonna look at Herzl in comparative perspective, has to not only have the charm and the work ethic and the ability to make people feel good about themselves, he also has to have the power to create really something out of nothing, whose charisma is actually perpetuated through imagery and through stories told about him. Just as he captured something in the moment, he has continued to exert a charismatic authority beyond the grave. In the second year of Israel's independence, the 22nd of Av, August 1949, the nation fulfills Herzl's last request, that he be buried in Israel. His remains are brought to Jerusalem for burial on Mount Herzl, high among the hills surrounding the city. I do not know the hour of my death, he wrote in 1898, but Zionism will not die. So now uh, we are privileged to hear really the central narrator of that film, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Derek Penslar, who is the William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University, really one of the most influential and certainly one of the most widely read Jewish historians uh, of our, our time. He takes a comparative transnational approach to Jewish history. Uh, he's written uh, numerous books, including Shylock's Children, Economic, uh, Economics of Modern Identity in Modern Europe, Israel in History, the Jewish State in Comparative Perspective, The Origins of the State of Israel, a documentary history, Jews and the Military, a history, the aforementioned uh, Theodore Herzl, the charismatic leader, and he's now completing a book entitled Zionism, an Emotional State. Professor Penzlar is the president of the American Academy for Jewish Research. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He's an honorary fellow of St. Anne's College, at Oxford. Uh, he's active in European, Jewish, and Middle Eastern studies at Harvard. Uh, and we are delighted to welcome him here to the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. Professor Adair Petzlar. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. So am I speaking loud enough? Does the microphone pick me up all right? Yeah. That's great. Jonathan, thank you for, for the invitation. And thank you to, uh, especially to Anna, because you've been the main point person uh, organizing all of this, at least uh, my, my, my part of it. So thank you for that. Thank you, David, for your marvelous collection of Herzliana. Thank you for letting me into your living room to look at the material, to take photographs. And that was some years ago. Uh, and I really enjoyed working through it, uh, through it all. And it's a lovely film. Uh, so what I'd like to do is maybe expand on some of the themes from the film. As I was thinking about it, the first time I've seen it, um, I was thinking about how when we talk about Herzl, it gets very difficult to separate three completely different aspects of his being that I'd like to, I'd like to detach from each other. One is Herzl the man, and then a second is Herzl as a leader, and the third is Herzl as a legend. Uh, because if we separate them, we see all the contradictions between them. But this is inevitably the case when one talks about a great, um, a great political leader. But first, Herzl the man, which doesn't, I mean, it shows up a little bit in the, in the film. But Herzl is not remembered, after all, in Jewish collective memory. He's not, this is not why people remember him as a, as a human, all too human. 
Um, there's a little bit in the film about his, his yearning for success and his sadness about the death of his um, sister. I want to talk just a little bit more about that. Uh, the fact is that political leaders, great leaders, often have great flaws. And it is a desire to compensate for those flaws or to make up for something missing or some lack in their lives that makes them great leaders. It might be a prerequisite, although it's by no means a necessary condition. And there are plenty of people in the world who are unhappy, unfulfilled, missing something, who do not become great leaders. Uh, so obviously, Herschel had something else going for him that I'll talk about in a little bit. But he was a troubled man. Uh, there may as well be honest about it. And I think that our era, the early 21st century, for all the challenges we live with, it's a much more forgiving era than, say, the mid 20th century, the decades of Israel's establishment uh, or of the Zionist movement before that. We're more forgiving, frankly, of people who are mentally uh, struggling, people who are emotionally or psychologically troubled. We deal with it now the way that we deal with physical illness. It's just something that happens. And I think that in some ways we can be a little bit more both open and honest about her insult and, and yet quite sympathetic. Um, he was a depressive. There's no question about it. Uh, uh, great leaders often are. They have high expectations of themselves. They have high demands. They're very ambitious. And unless they get the uh, dopamine or whatever it is that one gets, the kind of rush uh, that one gets from uh, success, they feel, um, they feel unfulfilled and, uh, and very sad. I mean, Churchill was famous for this. Churchill's black dog, as he called it. Um, Herzl also may have been, and I'm using this word very carefully because I'm not a psychotherapist, he, he may have been manic. Uh, certainly what happened to him in the spring of 1895, it can be called a frenzy. I, I, I've seen that word used and I used it in the film. Whether it's a euphemism or not, I don't really know. But when, what, when one reads what he wrote in the spring of 1895, it does appear to be rather mad but it's mixed with quite coherent and lucid and extremely intelligent statements. And there seems to be a period where he's at his most, as it were, unhinged, and then he kind of calms down after a few weeks. And you begin to get quite coherent material that will become, as I mentioned in the film, the basis of the Jewish state. Um, I've talked about this with psychiatrists. I'm not a psychohistorian. I'm not a huge fan of psychohistory. I know that you can't really analyze people from beyond the grave. But I, I showed the manuscript to psychiatrists and who read it and said that, you know, one documented manic episode certainly suggests that he, he may have had this problem his whole life, but we have no, no evidence whatsoever of any other episodes like that one. So whether we use the language of frenzy or mania, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that he was an unhappy man in a state of crisis, looking for meaning and unable to find meaning in domestic life. Uh, what the film doesn't mention, he did have a very unhappy marriage. If he'd had a happy marriage, he might never have become a great Zionist leader. Uh, he and his wife, Julie, were not a good match. Uh, both of them were troubled in different ways. And one thing I do in, in my book is I, I, I reproduce their private correspondence, which can be painful, but I think it's also uh, revealing. Okay, again, though, a person can have these flaws and not become a great, a great personality. Herzl also had ambition, as we've discussed, and he was searching for meaning in life. Herzl took to heart one of Wagner's most beautiful operas, Tannhäuser. He listened to Tannhäuser several times in Paris while he was actually going through that state of frenzy in June of 1895. And many people have talked about Tannhäuser as appealing to Herzl because of its music, which is quite stirring. But it occurred to me, and I was in Berlin a couple of years ago watching a performance of Tannhäuser, and suddenly it all, you know, I had this illumination. And I realized that he was looking for an Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the chaste, beauty, beautiful but chaste heroine of the, um, of the opera for whom Tannhäuser has a, a perfect love precisely because it's not carnal. Herzl had a hard time dealing with um, physical relationships. He, he was looking for something pure. And Herzl himself had some problems with women. He was given to misogynistic statements, um, but he was looking for purity and meaning and beauty. And he found it ironically in politics, uh, not the place where people usually go, but he, he, he did find it because he was looking for something to solve a very, a very grave problem. And that was the problem of the Jews. Now, 
I've talked about necessary but not sufficient preconditions. I mean, political leaders are often trouble, but there are plenty of troubled people who don't become great political leaders. Herzl was exposed to anti-Semitism and it troubled him. It, 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 it ate at him when he read Eugen Derling's anti-Semitic screeds from the 1880s, when he uh, read about uh, uh, the Panama Canal Company's crisis, when he uh, heard what was happening in his own native Vienna, when a notorious anti-Semite, uh, Karl Lueger, was elected mayor. However, lots and lots of people were exposed to anti-Semitism in Herzl's era, and they didn't become Zionists, let alone Zionist leaders. But to say that anti-Semitism made Herzl into a Zionist is a little bit of a shorthand. It's one factor. You combine a man looking for meaning, a man who's in a state of crisis. There is a problem with anti-Semitism to which he is exposed. It affects him personally. And he develops a sense of um, compassion and a, what he called in his writings, in the Judenstadt, a kind of um, a right to act on behalf of people in a state of emergency, even if they have not act, asked for it, what he calls the, um, the gestor negotiorum, the, the person who acts basically like a good Samaritan in American law. So he sees himself as a good Samaritan, although he's using Roman legal concepts because he studied law and he was briefly an attorney. For those of you watching who are going to law school, students who are going to law school, you never know what's gonna, what will happen to your career. Um, so the human qualities and the exposure to anti-Semitism account for his hunger, they account for his drive, they account for his sadness. Um, his, his exposure to anti-Semitism accounts for the nature of his quest, but not, not his ability to set it into motion. And that is the limit of a purely biographical approach to the life of a great leader. The human component is essential, but it's not everything. And that leads to Herzl, the leader. The fact is that when Herzl was a playwright or a journalist, and he was a very talented journalist, as I said in the movie, he displayed no leadership abilities whatsoever. He was hardworking, he was talented, he turned in his work on time, all to his credit. But he did not display leadership skills. And Herzl had a dream his whole life that he would run his own newspaper, he would found his own newspaper, and over and over again, between the mid-1890s and really uh, not long before his death, Herzl had dreams that he would leave his newspaper, the Neue Freie Presse, which he found rather oppressive. Uh, between that, working full time at the newspaper and um, you know doing Zionist work, he felt uh, he felt uh, overworked. But also, he felt that he couldn't really be himself in his newspaper because it was run by two assimilated uh, uh, Jews, in the sense that they were Jews who certainly were opposed to expressions of Jewish nationalism. And they would not let Herzl write about Zionism. In the newspaper. They only referred to Zionism and Herzl in their obituary of him, which by the way is a very beautiful obituary. Uh, so Herzl felt constrained and he wanted to found his own newspaper, but he failed. I mean, he, he details meetings with, with investors and businessmen and so forth, and it's really rather sad because he just isn't very good at it. Um, so he didn't display leadership abilities outside of what would become his Zionist activity. So how was he able to do it? Part of it was that he got some important people on board, like the successful journalist and playwright Max Nordau, who at the time was much more famous than Herzl. But also he appealed to young people. He appealed to university students in, in Vienna in particular. And there, there was a kind of buzz, to use the terminology of our era, Herzl went viral. Uh, he was invited to give speeches in one student association after another. And his charisma, ultimately enabled him, it gave him a, an opening to an audience of Jews with whom he would otherwise have had very little to do. So Herzl himself, as I mentioned, he went to a Jewish day school, he knew he was Jewish, but he was not a Yiddish speaker or a Hebrew speaker. He was not Judaically highly literate. He had very little to do with Jewish students who were devoted to Jewish nationalism and had been you know, since, since their teenage years. Uh, but he gained an audience. And then came that process of the dialogic construction of charisma, that Herzl had something they needed and they wanted, and he was able to deliver it to them. Sometimes it involved reading Herzl in a way that Herzl was actually not communicating at all. For example, people saw in his face the sufferings of the Jewish people. Well, Herzl had a dark complexion and large dreamy eyes, and he grew a luxurious beard and so forth. I mean, Herzl, Herzl's face was his face. 
but people saw in it what they wanted to. There was even a, an essay by one of his great um, um, aficionados, one of his great fans, called Vihad Herzl Auszusehen, How Did Herzl Look? And it's a, it's, it's a lengthy essay about Herzl's appearance. But again, appearance alone wasn't enough. Now, Herzl did have a work ethic. We talked about that. He did have drive. And what happened when he got in contact with these Zionist activists, his ability to, um, to engineer, as it were, to direct, to act in a dramatic, uh, to, 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 to create a dramatic display in his, play, in, in his theater, all of this came together. And suddenly Herzl develops not only effective imaginative skills or creative skills, he becomes actually very good at pushing people and negotiating with people and flattering people and getting them to do what he wants. That is, Herzl undergoes a kind of second rebirth a year or so after he um, uh, writes The Jewish State. He becomes a leader. He hadn't been that before. And believe me, the Jews that he is working with in 1896, 1897 are not easy people. There is a pre-existing Zionist movement known as Kibat Zion or Holabet Zion, lovers of Zion. These are people with a kind of territorial claim on Zionism. Who is this man Herzl, they ask, to, um, to tread on their territory? And with his ideas of a public Zionist Congress or of going to the Ottoman Sultan and demanding a charter for Jewish statehood, there are fears that this would endanger the very lives of Jews in the Ottoman Empire or endanger the very lives of Jews in the Russian Empire where political activity is forbidden. The Jews are already suspected of being revolutionaries. Who knows what they might be suspected of doing if they affiliate with such a overtly political Zionism. And yet Herzl won them over. Sometimes it was just they were bowled over by his appearance. For example, the Polish um, a Jewish journalist and polymath, Nahum Sokolov, did not like Herzl at first. He wrote in his newspaper, he wrote about, he did not like Herzl. He thought that he was a dreamer of dreams. Uh, and then he meets Herzl and he's absolutely just bold. But in other times and situations, Herzl negotiates with people with very different interests and desires. Let's all come together. Let's have a public meeting. We can air out our different points of view. You'll have your turn. You'll have your turn. Basically, he becomes a negotiator. He becomes both an inspirational leader and a transactional one. He's able to get things done. Now, do things go smoothly? No. The first Zionist Congress, they, they, they want to be in Munich, but the Jews of Munich won't allow it. So then they wind up in Basel, and they rent a room that turns out to be a depressing and filthy beer hall. And then at the last minute, the Basel Stadt Casino, which is just a, like a public meeting space, opens up and it all worked out. But there were a lot of glitches along, um, along the way. And the way he engineered the first Zionist Congress was amazing. It wasn't just the famous opening session where he asked everyone to wear morning, uh, to wear a reform address. We planned the program. You know, no one will get to talk for too long. Uh, the Q and A periods won't be, won't be too long. He didn't want long harangues. <clears throat> he let, he let everyone have their turn to speak. He, he, it was not a democratic, uh, democratically run event, but it had the pretense of democracy. It was really very effective and it went extremely well. And then the first Congress leads to the second, leads to the third and so forth. And each Congress is larger and each one has even more events. And by the way, in addition to the events we normally hear about, which is the actual discussions in, 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 in plenary, there were side events. There were social events in the evening. There were dinners. There was dancing. I think, David, you gave me the, the um, is it the little locket that Fanny Bolson uh, wore with her dance partner's names on it? I think uh, Leo Motzkin signed it and all of this. Stuff. And <laughs> That's correct. All, yes. I think Martin Gooper, I think a young Martin Gooper, actually, very young. Um, Heim Weizmann signed it. Um, and there were poetry uh, readings. Um, there was one, in fact, where a, an Algerian Zionist uh, 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 intoned a poem in praise of Jewish women, uh, oh goddess, uh, oh goddess, oh Miriam, something like that. So these were social events. They were political events. And Herzl really organized the whole thing. And he did it extremely well. However, outside of that world of Zionists, what kind of leadership ability did Herzl really display? It was tough. 
he was viewed in much of the Jewish world as a crank or as unhinged. And the non-Jewish world viewed him as a bit of a curiosity. The New York Times very first article about Herzl uh, just before the first Zionist Congress says, Dr. Herzl of Vienna uh, would like to you know, send the Jews to Palestine. Um, we find this idea to be uh, rather, you know, we're, we're not sure how practicable it is, but they put the news story in a little section of the Times called, the, uh, what was it called, the, not news of the day. It was a section of like little funny pieces of news, like smilers. So there was a story right before about how hard it was for the king of Bulgaria to hire competent assassins. And after the Herzl story was a little tale about the Central Park menagerie and an unlikely friendship between a rhinoceros and a cat. That's where they put Herzl. And when Herzl began to negotiate with world leaders, I mean, it is remarkable that he was able to meet with the Kaiser of Germany and the Ottoman emperor and the king of Italy and the Pope, Pope and so forth. It is, it is amazing, but we must realize that a lot of this was people were seeing him not as a great leader so much as an interesting curiosity in the case of the Ottoman emperors. You know, what can he do for me in terms of my, fi my financial problems? Although the emperor had no intention ever, ever, of granting Herzl any kind of charter for, um, for Palestine. Herzl was hoodwinked over and over again in his negotiations with the Germans because he was a, quite a Germanophile and he was absolutely besotted with the Kaiser. But the Germans were not going to push the Ottoman Empire to give the Jews a, a charter. The Kaiser was interested because he was an anti-Semite and he would have liked to see the Jews leave Germany. And the um, German ambassador in Vienna, Philipp zu Eulenburg, uh, really admired Herzl. But he admired him by writing, there's nothing like a trading Jew about him, a Schacher Jude. So you can see how he's damning him with saying, you know, with, with, with anti Semitic interpretation. So actually, Herzl failed as an international lobbyist, except when he finally got through to the British and they offered him territory in Eastern Africa along the Uganda Railway, which is still called in Jewish history Uganda, although it's actually Kenya. And this was an accomplishment for Herzl, a huge accomplishment, because the world's greatest empire was recognizing the legitimacy of the Zionist movement. On the other hand, it split his movements. It drove him into an early grave. He was already ill before this crisis broke out. And it, this was the final blow. So in a way, I mean, Herzl did have leadership qualities, but you can see their limits in relationships with the world as a whole and even within his own Zionist movement. But before I leave his leadership ability, I want to talk about one final aspect that people often don't know about, which is that um, he actually was very good at playing people off against each other. So in the Zionist movement, he compared it to eggs. He says, I'm, I'm juggling a bunch of eggs and I have to keep them all in the air without them breaking. He had secularizing Russian Jews who wanted to create a secular Hebrew culture. He had Orthodox Jews who were interested in Zionism for philanthropic reasons, and he had to somehow keep them from, you know, getting at each other's throats. And he basically encouraged each one to form a faction within the Zionist movement, the idea being that they would spend so much time fighting against each other that he would then be able to push his own um, plans through. And this, you know, so he, he, was, he, was, he developed political skills. He developed leadership skills, but he hated to be called a politician. And Herzl never took a dime for any of his Zionist activity. He never took any money for it. He was quite proud of that. He basically lived off of his wife's dowry and, um, and, and uh, family money. Um, so yes, he was a great leader for sure, but there were limits to his leadership. One could say that Herzl served the Zionist world well by dying in 1904. Students often ask me what would have happened if he'd lived. I think that at some point he would have been thanked for his years of service and he would have been cast aside because what Herzl gave the Zionist world really was his image, his self, his charisma. And then came the rather humdrum practical business of building up the Yishuv or building up the Zionist movement. And then along came, a, frankly, a much more successful leader than him, and that was Heim Weizmann, who had charisma, but who also understood the Jewish world and who had the good fortune to be a leader at a time when the Ottoman Empire was in danger, when it eventually collapsed who had a strong relationship with the United Kingdom. Um, so Herzl had his moments. But that leads us to, that leads us with Herzl the legend. You know, uh, I was looking yet again at the, the memorabilia, David, that you collect. 
in his own lifetime, you could buy little, yeah, like little Herzl matchbooks, Herzl ashtrays, um, and things with Herzl and Nordau together. That's something we, we, we forget about is just how famous Max Nordau was. So for example, if you see sheet music produced in, um, in New York in the early 1900s, it will be Hatikva, along with a song called Dort Vodiseder, which nobody, nobody knows today, but it was actually Herzl's favorite Zionist hymn. I, I won't sing it, so I'll <laughs> save you that. But it, it, there's a picture of Herzl and Nordau on it. So, and the two of them really made quite a team. And then his death, massive, massive public mourning, thousands of people attending his funeral. Um, Martin Buber, who'd been quite critical of Herzl, wrote a few years later, he wrote, we are all orphans now. Uh, he was the father figure for some, but people needed that father figure to rebel against. His death, his death shook them to the, to the core. And uh, Naftali Hertz Imber wrote a beautiful dirge for Herzl. The, the, the mourning was sincere and, and widespread. And then during the mandate period and the period of the early state, there was a celebration of Herzl Day, Herzl's birthday on the 10th of ER. Not that Herzl would have ever thought of it that way. And then the reburial that is referred to in the film was actually a full-scale military affair called the Tsa Herzl, Operation Herzl. And there were 44 torches for each of his 44 years. And he was buried with great symbolism on the newly created Har Herzl. Now, what the film doesn't mention is that Herzl never said that he wanted to be buried in Jerusalem. Never. He, he, he never left formal instructions, but he talked informally about wanting to be buried in Haifa. For him, the symbol of the Jewish future. Um, why did they bury him in Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem was at that time um, in, in not just political or military conflict, but political conflict with the United Nations claiming it was internationalized. And this was a claim on Jerusalem as the capital of the country. And the interior minister, Yitzhak Grunewald, even said, we're going to bury Herzl in Jerusalem. We're making our, our point. Um, and then you have on Herr Herzl, the military cemetery and the Herzl Museum, which offers a very reverential approach to the leader's life. I want to mention something a little bit less familiar, the radio program, The Eternal Light which is a wonderful source of information about mid-century American Jewish sort of mentality. They did an episode called Herzl the Wonder Worker. It's amazing. It's about a poor accordionist who doesn't make enough money to get by. And Herzl comes to an inn. Oh, I know what it is. It begins actually with a man coming to an inn. He sees a huge portrait of Herzl. And he says, oh my God, that's Herzl. I didn't know he was seven feet tall. People, Herzl was five foot eight. Okay, five foot seven and a half, five foot eight on a good day, which was tall by the standards of his time, but a giant he wasn't, you know. Um, but anyway, and then the innkeeper tells the story about how Herzl came to this little village. There was a poor accordionist. Herzl one day went into the public square with his accordion. I didn't, you didn't know that Herzl played the accordion, but he did beautifully. And the radio program has him playing Hava Nagila. I believe hadn't been written yet. It was written in 1930s. But anyway, he's playing the accordion. He makes tons of money. He brings it to the poor accordionist. He gives him all the money. And Herzl goes off to work another miracle. This is the eternal light. So you can see the kind of imagery associated with Herzl as more than a leader, but actually a legend. In the 1970s through 90s in Israel, at least, as the state became older, as um, more critical voices began to be heard. You began to get biographies of Herzl, studies of Herzl that did talk about, as I've mentioned, his personal problems. And, um, uh, you'd see this in the great biography by Amos Alon, written in 1975, uh, truly a marvelous pioneering work, and open discussion finally about his children who died tragic deaths and who all suffered serious, uh, from serious mental illness. And then as we move closer to our own era, and with this I'll stop, uh, that Herzl becomes really the common property to anyone who identifies with Israel, but politically he's seen as all over the map. That is, you have the left-wing Herzl, the Herzl of al in which a major character in the novel is an Arab, in which Jews and Arabs live in peace and harmony, uh, in which the land of the state, uh, or it's not even a Jewish state in al the Jewish cooperative commonwealth, uh, is a model of social justice. And Herzl himself cared deeply about social issues, about what was called the social question in the late 19th century. And he was explicit that he wanted the future Jewish homeland to be a model of social justice. 
uh, and really an or the goyim, a light unto the nations of, of the world in this regard. And the left in Israel has celebrated both the economic progressivism and the political, uh, even binational progressivism that Herzl stood for. Um, but the right wing has a very different Herzl. Yoram Hazoni has written about Herzl as a real um, politiker, uh, as someone who understands the importance of the state. And without a state, one is bereft of, of power. Uh, uh, and the, even the organization Im Tertsu is straight from the, uh, the front piece to uh, Alt Neuland. Uh, if you Im Tertsu, then you are told. This is kind of Märchen, it's not a fairy tale. So, um, so and, and there are books written by religious Zionists that claim Herzl was in fact something of a Balshuba, which I, I do think that's not the case. Um, so Herzl has become kind of a common property, but to finish on a slightly melancholy note, the most recent images I've seen of Herzl are as, as a kind of a, an unheeded prophet, a man whom we would do well to hearken to, but we don't. So the Gesher Theater, uh, former Soviet Jews in, in, in Jaffa have a wonderful theater, and they did a play a couple of years ago called uh, Herzl Amar, um, and Herzl comes back to life in this play. Uh, it's 1949, uh, the uh, uh, Israelis send in a mission to Vienna to disinter him from the Duke Cemetery. They dig him up and he comes back to life. And he says, oh, is Israel created? This is what it's gonna be like. And he tells them how wonderful it is and Jews and Arabs live in peace and all of this. And so what do they do? They actually kill him again. Uh, ben Gurion writes to, to the Israeli uh, uh, mission, bring me his body. <laughs> so they kill him and they send him back into, um, uh, uh, into the coffin. So this notion of something that has been missed. Uh, today, frankly, Herzl's name does not have the meaning that it does for people of Jonathan's generation, my generation, David's generation. Uh, interesting to hear from some of the younger people in Israel, in public opinion polls, there are many who do not know who he was. They think maybe he was the first president of Israel. They know that he was somebody important. But uh, despite all of the attempts in Israel to cultivate his memory, the fact is that uh, people have become less connected with his work, his activity, his accomplishments, and his, his limited. And for that reason, I'm really very grateful that the little book I wrote has generated some cross-generational interest. Some young people have read it as well as, uh, uh, as well as older people. And I'm hoping that the German edition of the book, it's being translated right now, and the Hebrew edition will also reach younger as well as older audiences and rekindle interest precisely because the book does not treat him as a legend, precisely because it does evaluate both the accomplishments and the limits of his leadership. And because ultimately it traces him as someone who was human all too human. I'm hoping that's something that can appeal to a younger audience uh, as well as more stalwart uh, readers from, from other generations. So with that, I'll stop and thank you very much. So uh, I see that some questions have already come in and I'm going to invite uh, all the rest of you if you have questions. Uh, to put them in the chat, and my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Shayna Weiss, is monitoring that chat. But before we hear from uh, Dr. Weiss with your questions, uh, I thought we'd hear for a few minutes from uh, uh, the collector himself, uh, uh, our friend David Matlow. Um, uh, he has a day job. He's partner at the Toronto law firm of uh, Goodman's LLP, but he really has devoted uh, the last uh, 30 years or so uh, to his Herzl collection and to informing people about Herzl and his work in order to inspire them to use their skills and talents toward the benefit of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. Uh, those from Canada know that uh, and uh, David Matlow has a weekly segment in the Canadian Jewish News uh, called uh, Treasure Trove. Uh, Canadian Jewish News is making a comeback, I read. And uh, he also serves on the board of the Ontario Jewish Archives and the I Center for Israel Education. I want to thank David for uh, 
making his collection available uh, to us and invite him uh, to say a few words. David Mallow. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to participate on our Brandeis program. In the same program with Professors Pensler and Sarna, it reminds me of the old um, Sesame Street song, one of these things doesn't go with the others, but I'm, I'm pleased to be here. And I want to thank Daniel Mooney for the film. Uh, I hadn't seen it either uh, until we shared it together. And, and, it's, and it's really a lovely, lovely film and, and it, it captures the es essence of Herzl. So thank you to everyone who's been involved. As Professor Sarna said, the idea of this program was hatched in a visit um, uh, in Toronto, to Toronto. Uh, uh, Professor Sarna was speaking at a, an event for the UJA and he came by to see the collection. And we talked then about the idea of having an event at, at Brandeis, and perhaps to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the Judenstadt. And that um, anniversary took place on Valentine's Day, February 14th, uh, 2021. The book was published on that day in 1896. So this promise of the event was fulfilled and it's a credit to the Schusterman Center and Brandeis University and everyone who's involved. Now, although I live in Toronto and I went to the University of Toronto, I do have ties with Brandeis. My sister Elaine is in the class of 1980. And I remember going as a teenager and seeing the marvelous, the marvelous school in, in the late seventies. And I think in a way that inspired uh, my daughter, Yael, who's from the class of 2018 to, to attend Brandeis. And she just loved, loved, loved it. And I, I know she's, she's watching a, a small connection right now back to her alma mater and a good friend of mine and my law partner at Goodman's, Mark Searchin is a member of the board of trustees, a, a big booster up here in Canada for Brandeis University. And he is the owner of Canada's largest collection of Brandeis clothing. And I know, I, I know that just from seeing him at work uh, daily. Well, Brandeis is a fitting place to, for this program. And the link with Zionism goes back to Justice Brandeis himself. In my collection, I have 5,000 items. And in my collection is this book, Brandeis on Zionism, published in 1942 by the Zionist Organization of America. And I just want to read one paragraph uh, of something that, that Justice Brandeis himself uh, said in 1923. And he talks about four years prior, so I guess in 1919, I visited Palestine accompanied by Jacob de Haas. Jacob de Haas was a person who Herzl himself encouraged to come to America to uh, seed and organize Zionism in America. And according to my understanding, it was Jacob Haas that connected uh, Justice Brandeis to the Zionist movement in this prolific career in Zionism, as well as being the justice of the Supreme Court. But he said, four years ago, I visited Palestine. Since then, I have never doubted for a moment that what we are striving for can be accomplished. Since then, my difficulty has been in understanding the doubt which others feel. If any of you harbor a doubt, go see for yourselves and the doubt will be dispelled. The truth of Herzl's statement, we have but to will it, impressed itself upon me at every point. And um, as Herzl said, and, and as Justice Brandeis repeated, everything that we wish is possible if we want it badly enough and work towards making it happen. This program, Brandeis University itself, the Schusterman Center, and of course the State of Israel are all examples of this. In uh, just under a year, literally 361 days from now, we'll celebrate the 125th anniversary of the first Zionist Congress. And think about it, within 18 months of publishing this book, and here is the book, this is a first edition of the Judenstadt published in 1896, Herzl gathered people together to start to make it happen. And he wrote in his diary that day, and his diary is back behind me somewhere. Um, he wrote, I, in Basel, I created the Jewish state. And what he meant was he was able to give people a sense it was real, that it could happen, and it did happen. And that, frankly, is Herzlmania. I'm honored to have been included today. 
I wish everyone a Shana Tova and a year of health, happiness, and peace. And in the spirit of Herzl, I wish everyone a year of continued strength to improve the condition of the Jewish people and our beloved homeland and a year of great success in pursuing that work. And I just wanted to uh, add one thing. Uh, Professor Pensler mentioned this dance locket, um, which he saw when he came to visit my house. And as an example of what was it like in the Zionist movement in the late 1800s. So this was a locket. It was a gift uh, from um, Max Mandelstam, another prominent Zionist, to Lady Wolfson, Fanny Wolfson, who was the wife of David Wolfson. And it's an autograph book. And the first autograph is Benjamin. That's Herzl, Benjamin Zev Herzl. And so the example of touching, holding these things means it didn't, it wasn't so long ago. Herzl died in 1904, not that long ago, yet a lifetime ago, certainly the lifetime of, of the Jewish state. And it was because of his, his will and his energy and everything that Professor, Professor Pensler talked about in terms of his charisma and his way about how to rally the people towards this critical, important cause, the state of Israel arose, and we are all the beneficiaries of that. And, the, and thank you to the Schusterman um, Center for studying it and teaching and communicating to enable us to learn about it and continue to be inspired by it. I'm inspired by Herzl every day and by this program, and I'm really honored to have had an opportunity to participate in it. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. Professor Penslar, thank you, David. Thank you, Professor Sarna. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Dr. Shana Weiss. I am the Associate Director here at the Schusterman Center. I have a lot of exciting questions that have come in from people. Please continue to send questions in on the chat and I will take a look. Um, first, I wanna start with a question that came in about Der Judenstadt, right? The Jewish state. And the question is, what kind of state is Herzl imagining, right? You mentioned already that in Alt Neuland, right, it's a bit of a company, right, or a cooperative more than a state. So, you know, in terms of Herzl's really idea of a state-based Zionism, um, what kind of state is he thinking about? And how does that work in comparison, let's say, with other Jewish thinkers, other nationalists at the time? Um, well, it's interesting that Herzl, like a lot of great leaders, he was politically quite flexible. And although he wrote a book, a pamphlet called the Judenstaat, he did not, he was not wedded to a concept of, you know, a sovereign Jewish state with complete control over its borders, foreign policy, the military. I mean, he, he was quite vague about some of that. And very early on in his diaries, first of all, he's not quite sure where it'll be. At first he's talking about Latin America and then he's he writes in Der Judenstaat, you know, will it be Latin America or will it be Palestine? And he pretends to give equal consideration for both, but I, I suspect that he's already pretty much leaning very strongly towards historic Eretz Israel. If nothing else, he's been in touch with Zionists in Vienna. He knows that's what they want. And uh, so that's one issue. The other issue is what kind of state will it be? Which, the, the thing about Der Judenstaat is, it, I mentioned in, in my own book, it's, it, it's, it's a classic in the sense that people praise it, but don't read it. It's actually mostly a technical manual. It begins with statements about the, the, the Jewish problem and how it needs to be solved. And then it goes into minute detail about not so much the state mechanism, but how the Jews will be moved to Palestine, how they will get rid of their property in diaspora, how they will establish new lives and so forth. Um, he doesn't really want to talk openly, I think, about statehood, partly because he knows that he, he could be too provocative to the, Ottoman, uh, to the Ottoman emperor and to the Ottoman empire. So Herzl's political language is really quite vague. Uh, when he negotiates with world leaders, he's talking simultaneously about many different forms of polity. When he talks to the Ottoman emperor, He's asking for a charter to allow massive Jewish settlement in what would essentially become a province of the Ottoman Empire. And he even says in a, in a, a, a charter that he proposed, he actually went and wrote it like here, here's a charter, you know, in 1901. 
and it says we will be loyal citizens of the Ottoman Empire. We will perform military service for the Ottoman Emperor. This is not a sovereign state. At the same time, he's working with the Germans or with the British saying, we want a protectorate. That's the term he uses, a protectorate. Well, that's not the same thing as a sovereign state, it's protectorate. Now, he doesn't use the term Schutzgebiet, which is how you would say like a colonial protectorate in German. He uses the term protectorat, which really means a kind of quasi-sovereign state, but under the protection of, um, of a foreign power. So this is not sovereignty, pure and simple. After all, this is the 1890s and early 1900s. Um, the Ottoman Empire is still strong, and Herzl himself has no idea, as the film mentioned, um, is the Ottoman Empire going to survive or not? So actually, Herzl was much more flexible in his political thinking than later generations projected him to be. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions, right? We've spoke about Herzl memorabilia and how it became popular and why. And I wanted to ask um, about the role that uh, the artist Ephraim Moses Lillian played, right? For those of you who may not be familiar, right? Uh, Lillian published a Bible, an illuminated Bible, I should say, where he illustrated pictures of Herzl in various biblical visages, right? Herzl as Moses, Herzl as Joshua. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to that Bible and maybe even a bit in a larger context, the role that visual culture, especially Herzl's actual visage played to this popular image and our notions of Herzl today. You know, we saw, David, that you said the first item in your collection was that portrait of Herzl and I, I lose track, there's two portraits of Herzl that look similar. That one may have been done actually while he was still alive, right. or it was done for the Hamburg Zionist Congress. Which one was it? I think it was when he was done, when he was alive. It wasn't a Lilium. I think it was a Copé. So um, already, I mean, look, he, he's a very good looking man. And Herzl is aware of his beauty, uh, just as Abraham Lincoln was aware of his height, uh, seriously. Uh, he was aware of his beauty and he was aware of his charisma. He writes uh, famously after a mass meeting in the East End of London, he says, I see my legend being born around me. Um, so, and he cultivates it. Uh, for example, he writes a letter to Lillian. I forget exactly when, but he's done a sitting for Lillian. And he even writes, make sure to destroy the negatives. And I think the reason is because he was probably partially nude for the, I mean, I'm not sure, but it makes sense. Anyway, Lillian portrayed Herzl, you're right, in many different ways, in um, as Moses, as Aaron, right, as Hezekiah, as all these different figures. And, but it wasn't just that. Uh, I mean, Lillian, I think he designed the, the delegate cards for two or three of the early Zionist Congresses, their works of beauty. He was a very popular artist. And the image of Herzl, I guess there's a couple of different images. Uh, one is that image of great towering romantic beauty, like the, your, the first item in your collection, uh, the great leader. But then the other image, particularly after his death, is um, a man who absorbs into himself the tragedy of his people. There is a portrait that was taken in 1903 or 1904. He's quite visibly aged. He's got gray in his hair. His face is rather haggard. And I think it was Hermann Struck, I think, who publishes that a few years after Herzl's death. But this is the image of Herzl that just, he understood it all. He took it all in. And as it were, he died. I mean, there's a Christological element here that he dies young uh, so that we may live. So there's actually these two, there's the kind of vigorous, young, beautiful Herzl. And then there's the older um, Herzl who, who dies as a martyr uh, uh, for all of us. But his, his image is everywhere in the Jewish world. And remember that when Herzl died, the Zionist organization had 100,000 members. And the world Jewish population was what, 13 million-ish at that time. Um, so it's not a lot. On the other hand, you know, any Jewish organization with 100,000 members is impressive. And for everybody who pays the shekel and who's a member of the Zionist organization, there are a lot of people who are sympathetic, who are reading the literature, and who are consuming his image which is in all sorts of Jewish newspapers that are not specifically Zionist. So you know, his image was hugely important. And you know, what if Herzl had not been terribly good looking? What if he didn't have the beard? 
It's actually a really important question because his appearance was a very important part of his of, of what made him successful as a leader. And if if I can add to that, I just happen to have handy. This is an E.M. Lillian. This is Herzl as Jacob wrestling with the angel. And there's a series of these, as Professor Pensler said. And also it was E.M. Lillian who took the portrait, the famous iconic portrait of Herzl on the balcony. Because not just an artist, he was a photographer. And maybe in the, in the, this was at the Sixth Zionist Congress in 1903. And this became the iconic image that, of Herzl, which we're all familiar with. This is on the balcony of the Three Kings Hotel in Basel. That hotel still exists, and you can rent this very room. It's called the Herzl Room, room 117, uh, and, and, and do this picture. And, and in fact, the people at the hotel know that this was so important in Zionist history that even if you're not staying in the hotel, if you go there and no one's staying in the room, they'll give you a key so you can take this very same picture. But I, I would add that this is signed by Herzl underneath it. And what this means is that he was a rock star. He was a superstar. People would go up to Herzl with his picture and ask him to sign it as you would to, um, in Boston, I don't know, Carl Yastrzemski or, or whoever in, in Toronto, Austin Matthews. He was a star. And the fact that he, he, he signed his own picture is evidence of, of, of how he was happy to also play that role. Absolutely. Um, can, I, can I add something just about the charisma of the beard? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry if I could add something about the charisma of the beard. I think that um, my own understanding of this in charisma, like when Weber coins the term, it's sort of this term for this thing that we don't really know what it is, right? But what I think, I mean, I, my working theory of charisma is that it's an individual, among other things, who seems to both embody and transcend his group's contradictions. Mm -hmm. And I think then the beard is part of it because he is on the one hand like the assimilated Jew, but with this undeniably Semitic looking beard. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's that's part of it. It's not just like, oh, he's obviously a good Jew because he has a beard, but it's part of the thing, it's the assimilated cosmopolitan journalist that this is part of the beard. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanna ask. Um, a bit about Herzl's critics, right? Which um, Derek, you alluded to earlier when speaking about uh, it, it sort of in your lecture. And that's thinking about sort of colonialism and Herzl's critics, right? When we think about the people who criticize Herzl and especially with sort of using the specter for them, the critical lens of colonialism, what does that Herzl look like, right? What does Herzl look like in the eyes of Zionism's critics and how does his image transform um, in these discussions? I guess that's the key question because the chasm or the, at least the, the, the continental divide between people who are fundamentally sympathetic with Zionism and people who are fundamentally not um, can be seen in how one views Herzl with the Rorschach test. So for example, the distinguished uh, scholar uh, Rashid Khalidi begins his recently published book, A Century of Settlement Colonialism with Herzl and the exchange from 98, I think, between Herzl and Gustav Dia Alhaladi, the former mayor of Jerusalem, in which uh, Alhaladi writes extremely politely and deferentially to Herzl, saying, I respect the Jews, I respect your connection with Eretz Israel, but you know, <laughs> there are people living here. And uh, there are, and I'm quoting from the letter, 300 million Muslims in the world, because that was the Muslim population at the time, who will not accept this. And Herzl's reply is rather breezy and assuring. We are, we, we don't, he says, we don't, we're not trying to drive anybody out. We're here to improve your lives. You know, we will bring nothing but benefits and so on. Herzl, like so many people of his era, of his geography, of his place, that is in Central Europe, of his class, upper middle class, saw in Western colonialism a, uh, a benefit to a benighted and primitive people. So that's the way he, he wrote about this. Herzl actually wrote about colonialism in lesser known articles that he wrote for the Neue Freie Presse. He wrote um, feuilletons, that is uh, sort of observational essays uh, about colonialism and uh, particularly about the phenomenon of bringing natives to Western cities to, as it were, be on display 
for the benefit or for the enjoyment of, of the public. They were called Fulkeschau, um, I think, in German, right? Isn't that the, the, the human zoo in English? And he wrote these are educational opportunities, and you can see these people. And on one hand, you know, it's colonialist, it's 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 condescending. Uh, he clearly sees Western civilization as superior. On the other hand, there's this kind of liberal meliorism. He says these people are all improving; they will all uh, mature, and and they're already changing. He says because the first thing that the natives learn to do when they get to the uh, European cities to perform is they go on strike. They have learned the principle of contract law. You know, so yes, of course it's paternalistic and, and colonialist, but it also suggests that you know anybody can be anything. Uh, it's much more environmentalist. In other words, he's, he's, he's not really a racist. Uh, so yes, but but the colonial mentality is is there through and through. In that, on the one hand, he's negotiating with the Ottoman Emperor. On the other hand, he's negotiating with European leaders. It doesn't even occur to him to ask the people in Palestine what they think. And by the way, there were some people in his generation who opposed him on that ground. Karl Kraus, who was himself Jewish, highly um, uh, deracinated from the Jewish community, uh, the editor of his own um, satirical uh, journal. Karl Kraus attacked Herzl for, I think what it is that he wanted to put um, Jewish settlers at the foot of Mount Lebanon or something, I forget the exact quote, but he was anti-colonialist and he thought Herzl was in league with colonialism. So it's not like those voices didn't exist at the time, but it was a pretty unusual. And I'd say Herzl was very typical of his, um, of his era. So do we view Herzl as, you know, he isn't Cecil Rhodes, for example. And Sometimes critics of Herzl make a big deal of the fact that Herzl tried to mobilize Rhodes' support. Well, he mobilized Rhodes' support because Rhodes was famous. And he was going to send him a letter, which, by the way, Herzl never sent. Uh, he actually never. So, uh, so I think Herzl is very typical of the contradictions within fantasy attitudes towards colonialism, a sense of superiority, a sense of paternalism, but also a sense of possibility. What's also interesting is that Herzl, although when he was um, going through his frenzy in 1895, he wrote one sentence in his diary about maybe expelling poor natives from the future Jewish homeland, he never returns to it again in a private letter, in a diary, in public speech. He never, so people who are critical of Zionism, you know, fasten on that and say, look, he intended right from the beginning to throw the Arabs out. And, um, but there's nothing, you know, there's lots of crazy stuff that he writes in the spring of 1895. So, so um, on the other hand, work written about Herzl from a pro-Zionist point of view ignores the diary entry altogether because they think it's embarrassing. They would rather ignore it, which of course I think is terrible. You have to deal with it. He wrote this. So this is where I really think that Herzl becomes a Rorschach test for how one, for one's most basic views about or feelings about Zionism. Uh, precisely because of the connection with colonialism. Right. And as you know, I know you've written about other places so well, like it raises really interesting questions of when writes a biography, how do you weigh sources like diaries, right, versus things like public speeches when, you know, constructing um, an image or a history of a person. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, I'm going to sort of bring together two questions is that one is that were there any really policies that impact of Herzl? Or did he have policies, right, um, for for the Zionist movement, right? Or was he, as you say, only this Rorschach test, a repository for things to come afterwards? And secondly, in terms of the sort of Zionist movement itself, right, Herzl comes on very strongly, right, becomes very very popular, and then sort of loses some popularity, and then of course dies quickly thereafter. So what, what did Herzl's death do to the Zionist movement and what effects does it have on that? So those are two sort of interrelated questions that you have two to three minutes to answer before I turn it over to Jonathan for a couple of more questions. Okay, well, as far as policies go, one thing Herzl was very interested in was what he called the conquest of the communities. That is to gain more and more supporters for Zionism within communities, which meant he supported uh, cultural work, cultural activities, songs, uh, uh, what do they call them? Magic lantern presentations. Uh, today we would call the PowerPoint. Uh, 
you know, he, he wanted the Zionist movement to become more and more popular because he wanted more and more support that ultimately he thought could be a lever for diplomatic support. So he was very interested actually in culture. People think Herzl was un, ignorant of or uninterested in Zionist culture, that's not true. Uh, he was certainly interested in balancing, as I mentioned earlier, the interests of Orthodox Jews with the interests of secular Jews and so forth. He wanted to expand the footprint of Zionism as much as possible. Ultimately, though, in his own short lifetime, he was hoping for that mythical, and unrealizable charter or the recognition from a great power, which then when it finally came, it was not for, uh, for Palestine. But he also, I mean, his policies included establishing institutions that would, he thought, in time, play an important role in the technical aspects of creating a Jewish state, like a, a bank. He established the Jewish Colonial Trust. Now it took years to raise minimum operating capital because people didn't want to invest in the bank, but he had this vision. Eventually it became Bank Lumi. Uh, he was a founder. He was one of several people who came up with the idea for the Jewish National Fund, the Karen Kayemet. This doesn't mean that he you know, thought of it all by himself. It probably would have happened without him. The point is that Herzl um, played an active role in the formation of policy and last, is the Basel program itself. The actual program of the Zeto, of the Zionist organization, the wording that you know, Zionism strives to create, what is it, a publicly legally recognized home or something, this is language that Herzl himself approved of because he did not want an open declaration calling for a Jewish state. And he was trying to reconcile the statists in the Zionist movement with non-statists, so he, he was very clear about his, the kind of diplomatic direction he wanted to take. So yes, he had some clear policies. As far as his death goes, as I mentioned earlier, it may have actually benefited the Zionist movement because he died so young. He died in a way that he could be presented as a martyr. Uh, when you read the obituaries, he's a kind of combination in Zionist history of a George Washington and an Abraham Lincoln figure, the founding father, but also the tragic martyr uh, who, who dies for his people. Uh, but without Herzl, it's true that the Zionist movement was rudderless. His successor, David Wolfson, was a very fine man and actually a very intelligent man and underrated. There's now a major German biography of Wolfson. So anyway, he's a serious man, but he was not charismatic. Although he had a nice beard, he was not charismatic. Then came Otto Warburg, a German scientist who was even less charismatic. But we're really talking about a period of a decade before the ascent of Heimweizen. And that's really what it all comes down to is that Herzl played his role and Heim Weizmann played his role and Herzl's death in a way cleared the, the room for the advent of the next truly great leader who would take Zionism you know, into, the, um, uh, into the heart of the international community. So thank you. I know there were a lot of questions we didn't get to and I apologize. I'm going to pass it over to Professor Sarna who will take, take some questions from people in the room. This is the opportunity for people who have been watching live. Uh, if there are questions or comments that uh, anybody would like to make, uh, this is the opportunity as we pivot now to uh, learning how to deal with multi-access programming. So those here in the room, anybody have a question or comment? I would make a Rachel. quick uh, comment. People who can't see me, Rachel Greenblatt, Judaica, librarian at Brandeis, that the moment for studying the uh, Zion, uh, the Herzl mania, the ephemera, is really ripe. And I want to thank you, David Matlow, and, and uh, Professor Sarna and Pensler, for taking this aspect seriously, even beyond uh, the indication that the sign that the ephemera gives us of the popularity of Herzl in his own time and later, another kind of confluence in time in terms of the scholarly moment is that one of the keynotes at the Association for Jewish Libraries this year was by Professor, Professor Shalom Savar about his ephemera collection in Israel. And so I, I think that it's it's really, it says something that comes to the fore now also, and it's worth further thought in the future about not just that this existed and was created, but the images, uh, the objects, what they are, and it's, it's also an interesting confluence that we're talking about the materiality of it, David, and I'd love to hear more about what it means to you. You mentioned the 
physical connection, but as we talked about negotiating the hybrid Zoom in-person meeting, and we talk about the physical ephemera and what that means, it's just, I have no questions specifically about it, but I'd love to hear more at some point. It's a really fascinating to me, the, the very um, phenomenon. Yeah. So I, if I want to make a comment for, yeah. for Professor Penslar, and also, well, it's a question, and I'd be delighted to hear Professor Gulley, non-verbal issues, Middle Eastern, North Africa, et cetera. How did Herzl look to them? You think, right? There's like this, this is very European sort of business language. And I'm just sort of intrigued to come across in your search and press your hand be curious to hear what you I'll answer very briefly and then I'll turn it over to you all. That I know more about Herzl and Nordau and their relationship with Middle Eastern Jews and, and Jews from North Africa which was, they didn't think about them a whole lot, except I think it's either in the beginning of their Judenstadt or Nordau's address at the first Zionist Congress or both, there is acknowledgement of persecution of Jews mm -hmm. in Algeria. So we, we talk about Jews in Algeria to the extent that they're persecuted, but I think it's Jacques Bahar, right? Wasn't that the, the Algerian? So Bahar wants an Algerian delegation to the second or third Zionist Congress. And Herzl writes, I'm not making this up, this is great as long as they come in native dress. Which would be what exactly, of course? What does Herzl have in mind? Who knows? But whatever it is, it'll be exotic, right? right. And as long as they pay their own way. So, I mean, no one gets paid. But so uh, he certainly had, you know, an Orientalist fantasy about these people. Um, I think there were delegates from Algeria who came to some of the Zionist Congresses. So I, I, but I just know about it from Herzl's point of view. But what do you know about it from the perspective? Yeah. So I, I want to just mention uh, one figure. You know, in the heart of my research, and he's really interesting figure. His name is Professor Abraham Shalom Yehuda. Oh, no. That uh, is, is, he was born in Palestine, is a Baghdadi family, and he was uh, delegated in the first uh, Congress. And he, in his account, said that he met, uh, spoke to, that's a few times during the Congress, in, the, in this kind of places that they have such media. And he, uh, Encouraged him to to uh, have a conversation with the with the Arabs living in the land, and he thinks that uh, Herzl didn't really pay attention to it, and uh, thought that he can speak only to the empire and uh, and not to talk to the you know the residents of the of the land, and he thought that that's part of the problem. And he had the same conversation with with Weizmann and other leaders and, and disputes about it. So I think in in a way it's not only that the and in a way, Abraham Shalom Yehuda is a representative of other leaders, the Saudi leaders, uh, a native of the land. Most of them were identified with Zionism in one hand, but in the same time wanted a conversation with the Arabs, natives of the land, that were they were sometimes uh, partners in, in commerce, sometimes living together. Sometimes, and they understood that if you need to, if you want to build the issue, if you want to build, uh, or to, to make a Zionist, uh, 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 if you want to do this uh, national Jewish uh, 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 issue in, in, in Eretz Israel, in Palestine, you have to be in that. Uh, so I think in Abash, Abash is a is a pivotal uh, member in that sense. He had a good connection with Max Nordau later, and he had a big uh, dispute with with the uh, with the uh, with the Weizmann regarding this kind of, of issue. It also occurs to me that there's also another piece of this, that in that group area, I'm sorry, that in, in that area, in terms of like the evolving Jewish internationalism at the time, you have this other organization, the Alliance, which is very not interested in science. And sort of that's its own vehicle to Jewish modernization and political modernization, or it's trying to be, you know, through Francophone civilization, and like whatever institutions they had influence over. Zionism was kind of off limits. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Herzl, Herzl yeah. no, and Herzl was, was yeah. uh, you know, he was, whether he was Judaically literate or not, he was certainly not plugged into the world of international Jewish politics. He, he, he was a fast study, though, quick study. One thing he did, for example, he never got involved directly with the Alliance, that Alliance. Mm -hmm. There was another Alliance, the Alliance Zubin which was an international Jewish philanthropy designed to assist Jews in need, but this was in Vienna, and it largely was aimed like Jews in Galicia. And Herzl worked very hard to get Zionists appointed to their directorial board. So he did have some awareness of 
international Jewish politics, but not of the mm -hmm. not of the Alliance per se. That Alliance. All right. There is obviously much to say, and uh, we we've, we've worked through a good bit of Herzl. We've mentioned Chaim Weizmann, of course, the great biographer of Chaim Weizmann is our own Professor Yehuda Reinhardt, and uh, uh, his one volume biography will appear, I hope, in the not too distant future, and we'll be able to talk about uh, Weizmann. We haven't mentioned Louis Brandeis, that's for, uh, for yet another day. Uh, for now, I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Derek Penslar, David Matlow, I, I really uh, uh, am, am grateful also to those who made this program possible. Uh, thank you for coming. Our next uh, program, our first seminar in uh, the Schusterman uh, series will be on the 9th of September with Professor Dukumiyafi at noon on uh, September the 9th. And on September the 14th, uh, we have the closing event of our first virtual exhibit, The Zionist Phantom, um, uh, an interesting closing event uh, with um, uh, Edwin Katsu, a local artist teamed with the uh, Israeli artist. And we invite you to look on our website for further events, uh, a very exciting array of them up from the Schusterman Center. Uh, it remains only to wish everybody a Shana Tova, a happy, healthy, COVID-free uh, new year, and to thank you for joining us. Good evening.